sharing on his, uh, on his uh, behalf because uh, he couldn't make it. So it's an honor to share this panel with these uh, great people that you all know, so I will not introduce them. So they all have written on fiscal policy, monetary fiscal policy coordination. So the rules is seven minutes each, and then that will leave half an hour for Q&As and discussion. And we will start with Pierre Olivier. Thank you very much, Lucrezia. So I, I thought I would try to set the stage. Uh, and so I will, broadly speaking, I will make uh, three points. The first point is about the channel from uh, monetary policy to fiscal. And so if um, I start, you know, we come out from a long period where date dynamics were very, very favorable. Um, this summarized in the uh, R minus G debate and uh, the person two seats over to my right is probably the most qualified to talk about this, so I will not get too much into that. But we had a period of very low real interest rates. Growth was not necessarily uh, stratospheric, but it was robust. And as a result, borrowing conditions were very favorable for, for sovereigns. And debt dynamics could remain stabilizing even without large uh, primary surpluses. Now, since then, we've seen a sharp tightening of monetary policy in response to rising inflation that has increased real rates and also weighs on activity. So we have lower R, higher G, and as a result, debt dynamics are set to deteriorate uh, considerably, and we are seeing debt service rising rapidly, for instance, as a share of, uh, of revenues. Now, not all is bad on the fiscal front in the last year because uh, the unexpected, there was a substantial unexpected component of inflation, and that unexpected component of inflation has improved uh, the ratio of debt to GDP, it improved the position of borrowers generally, and we've seen some declines in debt ratios in, in 22 and early 23. But the surprise inflation is behind us, thankfully, one might say, and it's unlikely to help much uh, going forward. Now, in addition, if the fiscal position is weak to start with, then when we have the monetary policy tightening, we can also get risk premia uh, that increase. We can get risk premia that increase for the sovereigns that are borrowing, and that, of course, worsens the dynamics even further, enforcing consolidation. Now, this is, I think, part of the worry that uh, everyone had uh, around mid-October when we saw the big repricing in 10-year uh, rates around the world, starting with the US, but also in other parts of the world, is, you know, waking up and saying, my God, if the 10-year if the rate is at 5%, are we all, you know, going to have a fiscal crisis around the corner? I think that was the worry. Now, of course, the 10-year rate has come down substantially since then, but we should, be, we should be cautious. Now, the rapid monetary tightening can also hurt the financial sector, and we've seen that also in the, the events that have played out in, uh, in 2023, and hurting the financial sector indirectly, that's also something that can worsen the fiscal position. So it amplifies a slowdown, but also it may, at the point at which you have a significant uh, financial risk, it may also uh, be, uh, uh, you know, calling on fiscal resources to deal with that. And actually, as a matter of fact, we've seen that both in the U.S. or in, in Switzerland. So overall, the calibration is difficult. Uh, we, we have a sort of a general principle, separation principle. We want to avoid fiscal uh, dominance, we want to avoid financial dominance, and central banks have a primary responsibility of uh, maintaining price stability. So whenever we see inflation going up, rates have to go up. Central banks have, uh, have to do it, but the pace is important and it can affect fiscal and financial uh, stability. So that's for the first step. What's the second point? Well, the second point is from fiscal to monetary. What can fiscal do and what, how does it impact monetary policy? And here there is a textbook answer which is that if you're tightening fiscal in a period of uh, elevated inflation, that's going to that's gonna be helpful. It's going to reduce aggregate demand, it's, gonna mod it's going to moderate price pressures, and it's going to mean that you need to do less on the monetary policy front. That's the textbook. Okay? And it also, because it requires less tightening of monetary policy, it might ease the pressure on financial stability, because you're not putting your financial system under as much stress. So it sounds like it's, it's all good. Now, the overall impact, and I'll come back to that, the overall impact kind of depends on the slope of your Phillips curve or overall slope of your supply curves. For instance, we know that during the uh, surge in inflation, fiscal policy in some countries, and here chiefly the U.S., played a role in, uh, in, in leading to uh, in, you know, stronger inflation numbers. And that was in the context of uh, supply constraints, steep supply curves. So the question is, do, should we expect the same on the way down? 
And so that, you know, let me mention a few things that may want to make us cautious a little bit. So first, if you have to sort of expect that maybe if the Phillips curve is remains steep, then yes, it might help. You might also think that it might help, for instance, because it will reduce the risk of fiscal dominance. By having the fiscal authorities tightening at a time when things are difficult for monetary authorities, you reduce the risk that somehow it will be, things will be more challenging for central banks, and as a result, that helps anchoring inflation expectations. That also helps uh, consolidating and bringing inflation down. You might think that uh, uh, it might also reduce uh, risk premium. If you have fiscal consolidation, there is less risk, either on the financial system or on the, on the public finances themselves. That also uh, could help reduce risk premia, and that's uh, uh, something that might be particularly relevant for emerging market economies. We also have some, uh, uh, some work that shows that it's more likely to be effective when, it's, uh, when the tightening is simultaneous, when all countries tighten at the same time. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that when all countries tighten at the same time, you don't get sort of the depreciation of your currency that would come if you tighten on your own, and that, that depreciation of your currency might, might actually work against you in terms of uh, bringing down inflation. But otherwise, if you don't have any of these other things, the magnitudes are a little bit problematic. In the standard models we have, if you have a consolidation of fiscal expenditures of about 1%, then you get something in reduction of inflation that is between 0.1% and 0.5%. That's kind of small. So if you wanted to do a lot on the fiscal side, you'd have to you know, bring down inflation. You'd have to consolidate a lot, and I don't think there would be much appetite for that. Okay, third point, and I will stop there. Uh, what else could you do with the fiscal side? And here, what we've seen is a number of countries in... Uh, during the last episode, where a lot of the inflation, and here I'm thinking in particular about European economies, where a lot of the, inf the sources of inflation were related to energy, the surge in energy prices, thought about trying to tackle the problem at the root. So let's try to control the surge in energy prices, and maybe that will mute the increase in overall inflation and maybe core, uh, core inflation. Okay, so targeting the source. I'm going to call this sort of unconventional fiscal policies, if you want. These are not fiscal policies that aren't supposed to work directly on aggregate demand, but more directly on, on inflation. Now, there are a lot of reasons to be very, very skeptical about this. Um, that is going to blunt the price signal in terms of conserving energy, which is uh, the scarce resource, and the market is telling you that it's scarce, it's having a high price in uh, an energy-dependent region when we think about Europe. Um, it's also going to be extremely costly for fiscal resources, in part because it's not going to blunt the price. It's going to blunt the price signal. It's going to lead, uh, not going to lead to a reduction in, in spending on, on energy. It's going to stroke aggregate demand because it's going to uh, increase overall spending, and therefore it could, through the aggregate demand channel, uh, work against you. And uh, there's been a lot of work on this. Actually, there was a paper uh, um, by some IMF co-authors presented this morning, Jesper Linde and uh, and others. That, that sort of goes through the, some of these arguments and, and, and shows that this is, a, this is a risky strategy. Now, in practice, during the 22, 2022 energy crisis, a number of countries, as I said, did this with energy subsidies, tax cuts, price caps. It was, so it was quite expensive, about 3% uh, of GDP for the countries that implemented these policies. The surprise is perhaps that it seems to have worked. Uh, and, and what do I mean by the fact that it worked? Well, there's a mechanical aspect. It brings down inflation because you just, you know, truncate the prices that are rising. So, of course, that's going to bring down some of the inflation. But it seems to have worked through the whole surge in energy price and coming down. So if you look at the cumulative inflation, it seems to have brought it down. So what is going on there? Well, uh, in some work I've done with uh, some IMF co-authors, which we presented uh, at the Sintra Symposium back in July, we looked at that question, and we found that it worked for uh, basically uh, a number of reasons. First, the shock was very temporary. There was an element of luck in that. Uh, second, the economies, uh, European economies, were not particularly overheated to start with. And so that aggregate demand stimulus that was coming from the fiscal expansion was not really much there. And so that, that was not creating much of a headwind there. And third, there was a lot of evidence that when you get this big increase in energy prices, they pass through very, very quickly into core inflation. The pass through into core inflation is, is sort of nonlinear. It's very, it's, very, uh, it's very high when you have large shocks and it's much smaller when you have more moderate shocks. So the combination of the three things made, uh, made it possible for these type of policies to work. But of course, there are a number of, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, ex ante, you may not be sure that these conditions are satisfied, you may not be sure that the shock is temporary, you may not be uh, absolutely certain about the degree of overheating of your economy, uh, and they remain, they remain quite expensive. Um, so I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Olivier. Good, so here Olivier gave you the IMF view. I'm going to be a bit more of a provocateur. I think that's the usual division of labor here. Uh, I'm going to uh, develop the theme which started with a conversation uh, with the governor Villeroy Gallo uh, in the previous CEPR uh, event this, this summer, uh, and uh, on which I've been thinking about uh, since then. Uh, let me just put the theme uh, out. The leaving aside the political economy aspects uh, and the governance aspects, I think fiscal policy is a much better uh, tool for stabilization than monetary policy. Now, the leaving aside is the big issue. And that's the reason there has been extreme reluctance to actually think in those terms. But I think given the comparative advantage, potential comparative advantage of fiscal policy, uh, this is something we have to revisit. And I'm going to suggest two directions. They are not magic solutions, but they, I think they go in the right direction. The first one is we worry very much about the discretionary aspect of fiscal policy because of the politics. So making as much of it as automatic as you can is clearly the way to go. And we've underinvested in that. We have automatic stabilizers, but they play a very marginal role. They were not designed for that. And then the other is that some of it is still going to remain discretionary, or most of it is going to remain discretionary. And you want to make sure that that doesn't explode. And that gets to the issue of fiscal rules. And I think on this, we've learned a gigantic amount from the discussion uh, in Europe in the last uh, two years. Uh, we're not there yet, but I think that we're getting, at least intellectually, we're getting there. Politically, we'll have to see. We were not there last night, but we might. So let me, let me develop each of, the, each of these themes. The, the first is, I think many of us uh, are influenced by the simple new Keynesian model with one distortion, nominal rigidities. So in that model, you have nominal rigidities. I mean, there's a marginal distortion about monopoly, but let's ignore that. And then there's a tool which basically gets you back to first best, which is the interest rate, because the problem with nominal rigidities is that they screw up the interest rate. So the Fed just has to adjust. And in that case, the solution is simple. Monetary policy is the tool. It is exactly the instrument which corresponds to the distortion, and it takes care of it. And I think we know that that's a first approximation, but it clearly has influenced, I think, both uh, research and policymakers very much. And the point is, when you actually think about the world in more realistic ways, you realize that there are many other distortions and many limits to what monetary policy can do, and fiscal policy is probably uh, a, a better instrument uh, in many cases. I'm going to give you two. The first one is an obvious one. I mean, suppose that half of the population half of the population is liquidity constrained then it's clear that the interest rate will have no uh, hand to mouth just to be extreme, right? It is very clear in this case that monetary policy will not work, but it is equally clear that fiscal policy can help by basically giving funds or giving transfers to the people who are liquidity constrained. It's going to do the right thing from a distributional point of view. It's going to do the right thing from a macro point of view. The other example is actually the one that Pierre-Olivier touched on in his third point. Uh, which is suppose that you have an energy price shock and you have real wage rigidity. Now, I think the standard story is you use monetary policy, but if you're worried about long run expectations de-anchoring a little bit, uh, you, what you'll do is that you will increase unemployment because you just don't want the inflation, which is generated by real wage rigidity, to actually go on forever. So in this case, you're going to do something which is not catastrophic, but it's going to be more inflation and, uh, and, and, and some unemployment. Now, I think about fiscal policy in this case. Now, there's kind of a magic solution, <laughs> which is suppose that real wage rigidity goes away, in, say, over a year. 
then for you, you actually do energy subsidies so that real wages or real income is not changed. And therefore, you avoid the second round inflation, you avoid unemployment. Now, you end up with a legacy. Uh, this is what Pierre Olivier mentioned, which is more uh, debt at the end, but it might still be very much worth it in terms of the macro outcome. Now, I think the, you know, whether it's a success or not, uh, it clearly had, it clearly was a very relevant dimension uh, in, in, in what has happened over the last two years. And the, the increase in energy prices relative to wages in, in France was only 20%, and when in some European countries it was 60%. And, you know, it looks like. Now, going back, these are examples, but fundamentally, monetary policy is a one or one and a half tools policy, right? The half is QE, and we know all kinds of reasons not to love it. Uh, fiscal policy is an infinite amount of instruments. You can use income effects, you can use substitution effects, you can use intragenerational redistribution, you can use intergenerational distribution by using debt and deficits. So on paper, it clearly is much, much, much better, I think, in most cases. Now, again, we now go back to the political economy and we know that in practice, this can lead to catastrophes of various kinds when fiscal policy is used and influenced by lobbies and so on. So the question is what to do. So these are the two points that I mentioned. So the first one is automatic stabilizers. And what we have are automatic stabilizers which were never designed to automatically stabilize. It's just the result of a progressive income tax system or something like this. But it was never designed for that. And we take it as a given. It's different across countries and we don't do more. It's clear that we can do much more. We can have quasi automatic stabilizers. So they're not completely automatic, they depend on some threshold, say some unemployment rate being higher than some reference point or some output level and so on. But then it triggers some adjustment. Could be an increase in unemployment benefits, it could be a temporary a decrease in the VAT. You can think of, of various ways. Now, again on paper, that actually you can go quite a long way by using that. Now in practice it's actually, you know, this is, again, much harder. And I think the main reason is that automatic stabilizers, by their nature, stabilize output. They don't stabilize the output gap. And when you have a lot of changes to natural output or to the natural unemployment rate, you may well make a mistake. I mean, if the increase in unemployment is due to an increase in the natural rate, you, you don't want to react. But you're going to react because in real time you don't know. So you have to design them so that over time you're going to learn and adjust. That's very far from obvious. But I think there is just a tremendous amount of work to be done, which is basically not done. Now, uh, last point on sustainability. So we had the Maastricht rules and we learned that it's difficult to have numbers in an environment in which many things change and that they are not going to work. So as a result, we abandoned the rules and we've been thinking about, we policymakers, we uh, researchers, have been thinking about what rules to introduce. My sense is we've made tremendous intellectual progress uh, in the sense that I think there is now widespread agreement among researchers that the right tool is this awful, uh, this awful acronym, right, SDSA, Stochastic Debt Sustainability Analysis, which is a way of putting together all the idiosyncrasies that a particular country has, such as implicit liabilities, which are going to come on the budget later, and so on. And I think we now have used it in a number of places. I mean, the IMF has been, uh, has been at the forefront, but other countries as well. And, you know, it's not perfect because we actually don't know the future, but it helps an enormous amount. I mean, you can see how paths, some paths are just going nowhere, and some paths are, and then you take into account the uncertainty, and you say, oh, let's be careful. So it seems to me that we've come to the conclusion that's the right tool. Now, the issue is uh, policymakers have not all endorsed it, and in particular, the Germans say, well, this is so fuzzy that it, 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 it is unacceptable. And I think the challenge there is basically to find, I mean, I think the German position is not insane, not right, but it's not insane. Uh, and we have to find some guideposts or some restrictions, some numbers that we can put in an environment which is very uncertain. I think that what's happening in Brussels in the last few days is trying to find numbers which kind of fit uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure, but I'll be totally happy with the outcome. But it is an intellectual, uh, it's a good intellectual question, which is can we basically combine the DSA with some hard number which doesn't stand in the way of doing the right thing most of the time? And I think on that, again, uh, we've made progress, but I think there's a lot of research to be done. Thank you. Dorothy. Thank you. Uh, so I, I guess I'll bring you more of the fiscal policy practitioner's view here. Um, and I, I want to make two points. One is uh, uh, looking back on the French experience of uh, unconventional fiscal policy, since we were uh, one of the first and the most extensive users of the tool uh, during the energy crisis, and the second one more, more forward-looking on, uh, uh, on what higher rates uh, mean uh, for the fiscal consolidation strategy. Um, on on um, unconventional fiscal policy, I mean, Pierre Olivier has set the stage very, uh, very well. I think um, and the, the paradox is, is, I mean, we have all the reasons to think it shouldn't work in, in theory, and yet it seems to have worked in practice better than, than we thought. Um, I mean, many reasons to think it, it, it shouldn't work in, in the face of an inflationary shock. I mean, uh, uh, we don't <laughs> like in general price control as economists. It mutes the price signal. It is supporting aggregate demand in an inflationary environment. Um, yet, I mean, I think the, the, the reason we, we did it, I mean, France, we, we put in place um, price shields on, on electricity and gas uh, fairly uh, early in the energy crisis. I think the reason is not that we didn't know that. The reason is sometimes um, you have to choose between doing something fast and doing something smart. And um, when it's a big shock, uh, and you, I mean, doing the smart thing that would be so well targeted that it would take six months or a year to put in place is just not, not feasible. Um, so, so in a way, I mean, that there's a political economy aspect and there's a pragmatic aspect of, of why we did this. Um, now, if we, if, we, if we think about also what is the rationale in terms of the policy mix of trying to contain inflation through fiscal policy, I mean, uh, there are reasons, right? I mean, relying only on monetary policy means, I mean, you would need a, high, a large increase in interest rates, uh, which in turn makes refinancing difficult and also involves quite long lags, whereas, I mean, this type of fiscal policy, of course, can act very, very quickly without lags. Uh, so, in a way, I mean, this sort of support to monetary policy and this inflationary objective, at least short term, through temporary fiscal measures, will uh, a compromise. Um, fiscal helps monetary contain inflation, but that, that has a huge fiscal cost. So, uh, the cost is higher debt, which in turn later can mean uh, higher um, pressures on, on rates. Yet, I mean, when we look back at the French experience, um, so on, on gas and electricity in particular, I mean, it did seem to manage uh, to, to prevent um, both volatility and overall level of inflation. I mean, as Pierre-Olivier said, I mean, if you look um, at cumulated inflation since early 2020, I mean, uh, of course, there, 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 there was a, a slower increase on the way up, a slower decrease on the way down, but overall, I mean, uh, the French total cumulated inflation rate over the three years uh, has been um, uh, almost uh, ha has been uh, three percentage points lower than the average of the eurozone. So um, uh, part of it seems to seems to be quite um, uh, persistent, and it prevented a, a price switch spiral. I think also in part because uh, inflation expectations are shaped not only by the sort of average level of inflation, but also by the peaks. And by smoothing the peaks, you also uh, help monetary policy and core uh, price expectations. Um, but um, I mean, of course, I mean all of this means that. Uh, in total, if we look at the sort of total um, uh, loss from the terms of trade shock, uh, the, uh, the state shouldered more than half of it uh, in monetary terms. Um, and uh, if we hadn't taken any support measures, which of course is a little bit of, I mean, even the size of the shock is a little bit of a purely theoretical exercise, I mean, uh, firms would have taken uh, more than half of it, uh, households about a third, and. And, and, and the state a much, minor, uh, much more minor share. So that means you know, it is only possible if it is temporary, if you manage to exit it. Um, I think uh, part of the reason why it worked is because the shock did turn out to be temporary and energy prices came down. Uh, I mean, this was um, the idea when we put these measures in place at first. I have to say, I mean, in the middle of the summer 2022, we're not so confident about how easy it would be to exit <coughs> these measures. Uh, in, in the end, I mean, the political economy aspects of exiting has been uh, probably easier than we thought at a point because uh, energy prices came down and then you sort of smooth the peak, but it's not, um, it's not that painful uh, to, to get out. So that, uh, that uh, I mean, definitely helps. It means, you know, um, thinking ahead, should we use these tools again? Well, you have to be really fairly confident that the shock is temporary. And um, in, the, in these circumstances, there's usually a huge amount of, um, of uncertainty. Um, maybe my, my second point is now, you know, uh, 
getting out of this succession of crises with, um, uh, with much higher debt, I mean, we have to think about what, uh, what is the interaction between the higher rates and, the, and of course, um, higher R minus G. Although, I mean, I won't talk about it with as much talent as, as Olivier, but uh, uh, maybe looking at you know, what are the implications from the perspective of making fiscal policy. Um, I mean, anyway, yes, I mean, debt has increased a lot. Um, now, if we look at R minus G you know, from in the, the French numbers, uh, if we look at nominal rates, it has turned slightly positive, should stay there at least for a couple of years. If we look at the average rate on the stock of debt, it is still negative. I mean, our energy is still negative, but uh, uh, getting closer to zero. Um, I think, I mean, in general, I mean, the trend is clear, so it makes, uh, for, from our perspective, consolidation more urgent because you know, uh, high debt means that uh, uh, things can snowball quite, uh, quite quickly when our energy turns positive on, on the stock. Um, I have to say also, I mean, to me, it's not clear that uh, medium term, we won't go back to R lower than G because, I mean, the structural factors behind the pre-crisis uh, trends uh, could prevail again, be it you know, aging, you know, lower productivity, risk aversion, demand for safe assets. Uh, so it may be structurally neg negative again in the future, and, but um, we can't really rely on it and we can't really bet the fiscal house on it. So uh, if that happens, it would be, in a way, a bonus, which we can use to finance, for instance, the green transition or, or aging costs. But from a policy maker's perspective, it really wouldn't be wise to count on this uh, R minus G turning negative again, because first, it is very volatile and uncertain, uh, especially in a volatile geopolitical environment where uh, current or future conflicts may uh, create uh, structural inflationary risk, where climate uh, risks also can be inflationary. And as I say, I mean, if you're with high debt in a sort of um, uh, and, and, and the sign uh, switches, it can, it can become very co costly very quickly. Uh, and we've, we've done some work also uh, looking at the past experience of uh, episodes of uh, debt consolidation in advanced countries, looking um, at, a, at a panel of advanced countries since the 1870s, and you know, in instances where the debt ratio declines for at least three years in a row. And when you look at these episodes, basically it tends to be with a combination of R lower than G and primary sur surpluses. There are very few instances where debt actually falls on a sustainable way, way uh, with are lower than G and primary deficits. It tends to be that you that you kind of need both. Um, uh, so, so again, uh, uh, you know, not not enough to, to bet the fiscal house now on. And maybe my last point is we do, shouldn't take the, the or all the G as exogenous. Uh, I mean, we do see that when debt rise, rises and when deficits rise, um, of course, I mean there is a risk premium aspect, which means in the even in the medium run, it makes it less likely that you end up in a R minus G negative. Uh, uh, situation, uh, but also, and this sort of circles back to the EU fiscal rules room uh, debate, we also shouldn't forget that uh, G is also endogenous to the fiscal path, and I think this is really the crux of the debate we've been having in, uh, um, on, on, on the, uh, on, on the, um, at the EU level. I mean, we, we have learned, in a way, the uh, lesson from the 2010s about making fiscal consolidation gradual and uh, making sure that uh, we preserve uh, space for investments in favor of potential growth, uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that uh, we put debt on a, on a sustainable path uh, without having this sort of excessive fiscal adjustment, but sufficient fiscal adjustment, and this is, of course, all the uh, debate about where that balance lies that, uh, that we have been having uh, with Germany in particular, but uh, not on. Thank you, Antonio. That's your last word. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, when I was preparing my comments uh, for this panel, I was thinking that if we lived in a textbook world, this panel would not be that interesting because the interactions between monetary and fiscal policy are either obvious or sometimes they reinforce each other, which is what Pierre Olivier was saying. Now, we don't, and fiscal policy and monetary policy either fail to live to the standards of the textbook or things happen that surprise either policymakers on the fiscal or the monetary side. Now, what is it that we see deviations or what I see deviations from the textbook uh, policy? If I look at fiscal policy, the textbook says, what do we need? A strong fiscal, long-term fiscal framework that lets automatic stabilizers or discretionary policy adjust to cyclical conditions. Now, I don't think we have a strong long-term fiscal policy framework. I think we lived a little bit under the illusion that maybe we had. Uh, my reading, maybe others in the panel disagree, is that in recent years we, we were always on the edge of unsustainable policies and only the surprises of lower interest rates that no one anticipated, I don't think governments did, sort of put us back on a path that looked more reasonable. 
Now, that game seems to have finished, although we can speculate about where interest rates are going. Uh, and now we see, obviously, the pressure on those plans that look a lot more unsustainable. Because when I hear the IMF talking about fiscal policy today, the word unsustainable shows up many <coughs> times in their documents. Um, now, beyond the long-term fiscal framework, when it comes to sort of adjusting for cyclical conditions, I don't think we're in the textbook case either. I'm glad Olivier raised the issue of automatic stabilizers. I have to bring an anecdote he might not remember. In 2009, when he was at the IMF, he organized a conference on automatic stabilizers where he asked me to do a presentation. In that presentation, I went back to the literature and I found two papers of Olivier, one written in 1999, sorry, 1994, that said uh, the literature in automatic stabilizers is almost inexistent. We're making a mistake. Now, five years later, he wrote another paper in 2004 that he says, we're not doing enough work on automatic stabilizers. <laughs> I fully agree with him, and I'm glad that he's coming back today, almost 20 years later, and he's saying the same thing, because we're not doing enough. And even if we're doing a little bit more, so I did a little bit of search before this panel, I say, okay, there's more papers uh, in the academic literature. I don't think they're having a serious impact. Okay, I don't know if we're ready to give up, or we'll meet again in a few years, and we'll have the same conversation. But that means that it's all about discretionary fiscal policy, and there I was very pleased with the words that Olivier used today, because I was gonna come here and say, the conventional wisdom is, we should always use monetary policy first, and then we never use discretionary fiscal policy, because that's, that's not gonna work, it cannot be timed, it cannot be targeted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I have come to the same conclusion as Olivier, maybe I'll put it even more strongly. I think in the last crisis, we have seen how discretionary policy can be, can be incredibly powerful. Now, you can argue that monetary policy was constrained by the zero lower bound, but I would like to see a counterfactual. What would have happened if we had entered COVID with interest rates, say, at 5 6%, and monetary policy had all the room to cut interest rates, and fiscal policy had done nothing? I mean, I would like to see a counterfactual with what the outcome of that crisis would have been. My view is it would have looked a lot worse with our fiscal policy than with fiscal policy. So I think that's an important lesson. And of course, there's lots of political economy issues that one has to work before making that recommendation. But I think the last crisis, at least to me, has shown that it's not that fiscal policy comes always second. It can maybe comes first, or at least it comes at the same time. Now, there's lots of issues that I don't think we'll have the time to discuss, which is about the art of fiscal policy. I mean, some of them have come up. Again, it's all very easy to talk about frameworks and big goals, but, but the complications is when we have a trade-off, a trade-off between do we do a fiscal consolidation now at the cost of potential output? As Hélène was talking in her panel, how do we trade off sort of a COVID crisis versus the cost of the fiscal cost today? Again, we can talk about Ukraine, same story. Th these are very difficult trade-offs. Uh, again, I don't think we have, I don't have a formula for how to deal with them, but it, it goes beyond just the framework, it's sort of the execution of fiscal policy. Now, let me say a couple of words on monetary policy. Again, I think monetary policy is coming to a world where nuances matter a lot more than they used to. I think for many years, we sort of been hitting the accelerator. I'm gonna call this the model, whatever it takes. Uh, and for a while, let's, let's think about the euro area, we had the central bank saying, we're gonna make sure that spreads between different countries' bonds are gonna stay to a minimum, because if they increase, that bad news for inflation, that bad news for the transmission of monetary policy. I don't think we are in that world anymore. Recently, when interest rates started going up, it was a very difficult business, I assume, for a central bank, because why is the interest rate going up? Is it the market trying to discipline a sovereign, or is it the market going into a place that they shouldn't go, and then we should do something about it? And the reality is those are much more difficult questions than some of the questions we faced before. Again, to me, that's a lot more about the execution than the framework. Uh, again, the same is the question about what, do, what does average mean in average inflation targeting? What does the long-term targeting, long-term inflation means? We just went through an episode, which I'm not sure we digested well, we just had a temporary, hopefully, a temporary increase in inflation against a recovery that was by far the best recovery ever, if you compare many, many past business cycles. Again, how do you compare those two things? How should monetary policy look at the trade-off between having sent unemployment down, if they did anything in conjunction with fiscal policy, having sent unemployment down to the same level up before the crisis 
in about two years, as opposed to 10 years, which was the previous cycle. So again, what does temporary mean? What does average mean? I think those are, again, questions of execution, not so much about framework. OK, thank you. So we have 20 minutes for Q&As. Um, I see Silvana there. Uh, we collect two or three, and uh, Silvana, Charlie. And Thank there. you. Yeah. So it seems that uh, price subsidies, energy price subsidies have worked very well this time around. And as you emphasize, most of you, um, the temporary nature of the shock helped uh, here. But in thinking about the future, um, I think there has to be more robust thinking about how to prevent these shocks uh, through investment in technological diversification, in inventory policies, or you know some some other ways to, uh, to uh, minimize. So uh, I agree that we need more savvy automatic stabilizers, but that shouldn't distract us from you know the investments on on, on preventing these shocks. And just as a you know aside, why I'm worried about overdoing the use of these subsidies. I mean, as you probably know, Argentina, you know, par part of the big problem is that it's been subsidized in this price energy and it's always a ratcheting effect. I mean, you always need more and more. Charlie. Uh, thanks, v very interesting uh, contributions from the panel. I very much agree with Olivia's uh, line that we need to put more weight on fiscal policy the uh, fiscal instruments are potentially um, uh, better targeted. You've got a m much broader range of them and so forth. Um, my worry, though, um, from experience of seeing politicians using fiscal uh, policy, it's not difficult to persuade them uh, to deploy it when times are bad. Uh, the difficulty is getting them to be sufficiently... Um, retentive uh, in times of good and building up space for the next bad shock that comes along. Uh, and clearly, if you're going to use it more actively, uh, you need to be more active in building up that space in the, the good times. Uh, now, obviously, the debt sustainability analysis helps as a tool, but have you got any thoughts on the appropriate institutional framework uh, that would encourage uh, appropriate behavior in the good times. I have a question there, and then we have a round of answers. We've heard two stories pointing in the opposite direction in the current inflationary environment. We've had Antonio and Pierre Olivier in the conventional view, uh, higher inflation, fiscal consolidation. We've heard Olivier uh, very persuasively argue that uh, there should have been the opposite, a particular form of tax cut to help lower uh, um, prices immediately, temporary shock, carefully qualified. Do we conclude that actually there were two kinds of inflation going on, a demand inflation and a cost price inflation, and that that opens Olivier's argument that there's a thousand possibilities in fiscal policy, and maybe we should use two of them at once and be both expansionary and contractionary at the same time? Is that where we go? Well, I have to make an exception for Francesco who wants to <laughs> squeeze in a question. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Uh, what? Oh, okay. Price subsidies worked in Europe. Silvan is right. Uh, they worked, but now it turns out, at least in Italy, that it's not easy to get them out of the system. So the Argentinian example is a good one. Uh, the would have been an alternative, an orthodox solution, which is what the Italian government proposed the week after <coughs> the invasion of Ukraine, which was a price cap on gas. Uh, it took uh, 11 months to convince the rest of the EU members to agree on this. When they agreed in December, so eight months later, uh, was one of the elements that, that caused the price of gas. To so we have to think an orthodox way, uh, probably the least uh, dangerous So the Subsidies was a dangerous one. The other one was politically difficult. When it came into place, it worked. OK, so the questions were addre addressed to everybody. But uh, uh, so mm, you want to start with? Uh, yeah. yeah, I can. Uh, so first, um, I thought I talked about uh, unconventional fiscal policies as well. But uh, um, let, me, uh, let me maybe be a bit cautious and, and 
to be clear, when we did this work on the energy policies at the fund, there were some trepidations in our fiscal affairs department. Mm -hmm. They were not. They were looking at this and saying, "Are you sure you want to come out and uh, and, and mention this?" Um, and and there are good reasons for this. And I think that goes back to Charlie uh, Charlie's point. Um, if we're telling a story where for 10 years plus, central banks have been unable to hit the 2% target from below because zero lower bound and whatnot. And then we tell the story uh, after the COVID and inflation surge of central banks being unable to reach the central bank target and they need fiscal policy to come in and do the job. What do we need central banks for? And do, what do we need central bank independence for? And I don't think that's where we want to land with this discussion. And I hinted at one of the reasons why, which is that even with automatic stabilizers, I think in normal times, the amount of consolidation you need to achieve a given reduction in inflation is quite sizable, and monetary policy is going to be more effective. And so I think here that the way I think about it is very much in line, if you want, with the uh, uh, orthodox view uh, uh, at the fund, which is that fiscal policy has a role to play, but it's more of a supporting role. It's not the, it's not the main character in trying to bring uh, uh, inflation down. Now, there are exceptions to this, and under the right circumstances, they can work, and that's the case uh, uh, of the energy crisis, which is a very, very particular case when you have energy prices going up you know, by hundreds of percent when you look at the price of natural gas, uh, gas or the price of electricity, and so I think we have to be a little bit careful here. Uh, another reason we want to be careful is also mentioned by Charlie. How do we unwind these things? It's very, very difficult. Look even in the case of France, with, you know, all apologies to Dorothée, uh, not all the energy measures have been withdrawn, uh, yet we are not in an energy crisis any longer. So, and, you know, of course, if you go all the way to Argentina, then you see things that are put in place are never removed. So I think we want to be uh, super careful. Last point, and this is to, uh, in a sense, to Antonio's uh, uh, earlier comment, um, I think when we talk about fiscal policy, Olivia said something that I think is very, very important, which is we have multiplicity of instruments when we talk about fiscal policy, and we want to separate maybe aggregate demand fiscal policy from transfer policy. I think during COVID, for instance, transfer policy was extremely important. It was not to support aggregate demand. The point was not to get the economy to produce. The point was to keep people's income while they were not able to work. That was transfer. This was not about stimulating aggregate demand. It worked, and monetary policy would not have been able to do this, even if you started from 6% nominal rates. There was no way it could have worked. I mean, this is, and there's a lot of uh, theoretical work on this. Lucrezia's uh, latest report with, uh, with Silvana on the uh, Geneva report is actually uh, using models that have this kind of feature. And so I think it's important when we think about fiscal policy that we also recognize what we're trying to accomplish with this. Thanks. Yeah, let me try to reduce it to a small number of points. <laughs> uh, on, on whether the slope of the Phillips curve is really first order in determining whether fiscal or monetary policy should be used, I think that's not quite right. I mean, if we think that most of the effect, given expectations work through labor market tightening or goods market tightening, there is an equivalence. And the Phillips curve is flat, which means that indeed moving activity doesn't have a very big effect on inflation. That's more an answer to Pierre Olivier. On preventing shocks, I wish, right? <laughs> we can't, but I think that shocks are going to come. I think what, what happened in the last two years came from, and the fact that the outcome is not so bad, comes from the anchoring of long-term expectations. And I think basically that's an es essential ingredient to have in, no matter what the shock comes, that basically you know that the central bank is committed to return to uh, some target. And I think that made a lot of difference. And then you accommodate the shocks whichever way, whichever way you can. But it seems to me that's... On uh, Charlie, yes, I mean, the institutional framework is clearly of the essence, right? Which is, you know, thinking about the fiscal rules at the EU level, what happens if countries don't satisfy the path that they have committed to? And clearly, it has to be, uh, you know, it has to be financial in some form. I think at the EU level, at the national level, you can have a constitutional court or things like this to actually handle it. But it's clear it's part of it, right? If you have a DSA and it shows that there is a problem and nobody does anything, that's useless. Uh, and then, David, 
I would not advocate, whenever there's an increase in the energy price, to actually do what France did, which is to limit the price, because as Pierre-Olivier said, you know, we didn't know how long it was going to last, and even if, you know, basically you know that you can't do this forever, if it's permanent, and you'll have to take the subsidies away, and that's going to be politically costly. So I don't think that's a general recipe. I'm not concluding from that, but whenever there's an energy shock, we should basically limit the increase in the price to protect consumers. But I was giving this an, as an example of a tool that potentially can be used uh, in the panoply of tools to deal with an energy shock. Uh, when going back to the question, yeah, how to prevent energy shock is the point where I mean, it's not that we can't do nothing, but of course, I mean, it's it's, it's hard to know. Um, and and for this, I mean, the, yes, of course, there are structural things we, we we can do and we try to do, which are you know reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, uh, uh, the EU electricity market reform, and this takes time, but this is I mean, you you, you should do uh, until the next energy shock strikes uh, to to. Uh, then I think the, the, the question uh, that was really your question is there has to be a better way next time. Um, then and, and, and this I share, I mean, just be, because I said, well, you know, it, the, the price shields actually seem to have work in the fridge case. I think, um, I mean, I, I share the view that, I mean, there were a specific set of circumstances that made it work. Um, it was a inflation that was rooted in very specific, I mean, in basically in gas and electricity and oil to a, to a lesser extent. So it's uh, <coughs> uh, not sort of generalized inflation in the first place. Uh, the shock turned out to be temporary. Uh, also, I mean, I think it's, it has to do to some extent with the, so some things about, about the French institutional frame. I mean, a lot of things are indexed to inflation, the minimum wage, um, a lot of welfare benefits, et cetera, so sort of preventing inflation. I mean, it, or another way of saying it is, I mean, there was a fairly high risk of a price wage spiral uh, because of this mechanism that made it maybe more worth it uh, trying to do this than it could be in other countries. Um, so, but, but I think, I mean, um, Having this experience, uh, what we also need to, to take out of it is thinking, well, there will be a next energy shock. We don't know when, we don't know from where, but it's pretty sure there will be. Um, and trying to think ahead of um, how could we uh, design the tools better. I mean, part of the reasons we couldn't or we wouldn't do uh, targeted fiscal transfers to, I mean, normally we would want to do sort of targeted fiscal transfers to the most vulnerable households, but not tied to their uh, energy consumption. The thing is, um, in, in that case, with a very, very steep increase in energy prices, if you just target by income, which is the information you have as a government fairly easily, um, it's really, really imperfect. And I think given that we are likely to have more of these shocks in the future, just to sort of thinking about what is the right targeting in these kind of uh, uh, cases that sort of make sense in terms of incentives and in terms of uh, getting uh, support to, to the people who need it most, who, you know, depending on, could be depending on where you live, etc. Uh, and, and having the sort of short-term and, and long-term incentives uh, aligned is also something we need to think of uh, while uh, we are in a better time. Uh, maybe one thing, um, I mean, I just want to be... Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe uh, a little bit more provocative on the on the sort of institutional framework for building fiscal space in good times and this being fully aware that uh, France is not exactly uh, uh, the country with the best track record of that. I think, I mean, this is, I mean, this is uh, part of, I mean, this is what the reform of the EU rules is trying to do, to, to give the right incentives to do that. Uh, I think part of the reason why the past EU rules didn't succeed is um, that there were, I mean, in some ways, uh, I mean, basically, you know, if the rules make sense, they have more chance of being respected. Um, I'll, I'll put it that way. And uh, if the rules make sense because they're rooted in a DSA, because um, they don't give incentives to sort of cut an investment and growth because that's the easiest thing to do uh, in order to sort of uh, stay within the, list, within the lines, um, they have a better chance of being respected. And I think, I mean, in... Uh, um, uh, this is this is also why I mean we are sort of careful in the negotiation of making sure that the um, different sort of safeguards that are added uh, to make rules more uniform across countries don't um, completely override the spirit of putting it in the DSA to um, make the rules more economically um, uh, funded. No. Antonio, uh, be brief so that we can squeeze another couple of questions. Be very brief on the question on when do we sort of pull back stimulus and when do we build the buffer for the next crisis. Of course, there are lots of great institutional questions that we need to ask. I think f from our point of view, academics, I do think that some of the models we use to think about the business cycle are not very productive. When we think in terms of models with frequent and small shocks, 
it is very, very difficult to, to think about sustainability and when you pull the plug. Now, my view is there's very <laughs> infrequent shocks. They're very large. They're asymmetric. And if you look at expansions, they never end. That's my view. So if you're waiting for an expansion to end to sort of build a buffer for the next recession, it will never work. And I think it's our job as academics to have a, an academic framework that is a little bit easier for policymakers to make that decision. I don't think we do today. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Richard, and then, and then you. Yes, Richard Portis, London Business School and CEPR. Um, there's been a lot of, dis a lot of the discussion has been about controlling inflation. Uh, and I'm wondering whether we're not uh, fighting the last war and thinking, maybe we should be thinking about going to the last war, but one. Uh, on two counts. One is on the fiscal side, Olivier was talking about R minus G. Uh, R is, of course, real. Uh, and uh, the latest uh, New York Fed estimates of R star are zero for the Eurozone. Okay? Zero. Um, and, uh, and if we think about the implications for monetary policy, um, are we in danger of falling into back into a low inflation trap. Uh, so two questions there. One has bearing on the, the, the role of our star, the bearing of our star on fiscal policy and the other on monetary policy. You may want to say we should disregard it entirely. <laughs> okay, another question there. Yeah, no, you can pass it. Uh, yes, thank you. Fadi Rufal from the OECD. Uh, the, the, the Point. The first one is just to be a little bit provocative with Pierre Olivier. Isn't there some more tolerance toward monetary policy dominance than toward fiscal policy dominance uh, in the way you frame the different things? And, uh, and, and the second point is linked to the debt sustainability analysis. I think we may need to go a little bit beyond because we need an anchor to, de to design the policy uh, where, where, is, where should be the direction of that policy, uh, of fiscal policy. What I mean there is we've seen like in the Great Recession and, and, and the, this shock, the increase, the average increase in debt to GDP level is around 15 percent, 15 percentage point and 20 percentage point. So if you look at that, you can think about what would be your prudent debt target level. And if you look at the, this DSR and the different shocks, you look the variance or the fan chart, you have something between 20 to 30 uh, plus minus. So I think going beyond and defining a, a, a prudent uh, debt target would tell whether a country after the shock should be consolidating to end up below this uh, prudent debt uh, target. So, if you have views on that, thank you. Okay, we have two, two minutes, so we have to close. So I propose that uh, you answer to the specific question and then uh, very briefly you tell the audience whether you think we are going back to a low interest rate environment. I should start? Let's start with him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on uh, monetary policy dominance, I think, I think it's a common view that somehow we should certainly avoid fiscal dominance. It brings all kinds of bad things and it doesn't allow uh, to maintain price stability. So I would certainly subscribe to the view that to the extent we can, we uh, should not have monetary policy decisions that are designed to address, um, you know, the funding gaps on the fiscal side or, 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 or any other things. On, on the DSA, I think that's precisely, um, I'm not sure I understood the specific question, but I think, I think um, the DSAs should take into account the fact that maybe there are different regimes for interest rate. This is connecting with the first question by Richard. Uh, so a debt to GDP of 100 may be uh, something that is benign when interest rates are close to zero. It's something that is not benign at all when interest rates, real interest rates are 3% or 4%. I think we need to have uh, uh, modeling frameworks that allow for uh, these kinds of uh, fluctuations, um, uh, although it's hard to anchor them with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, but, but we can do the best we can. So I, I certainly think that the framework in general is flexible enough to, uh, to uh, provide some guidance as to where debt to GDP levels would be prudent given the current environment in terms of interest rates and growth rates. Um, should we go, are we going back to low R star? Uh, 
On this, the fund, we did a, a chapter of our World Economic Outlook back in April, uh, and our conclusion was with sizable uh, uh, confidence bands, we think so. I'll stop here. What do you think? So I have a lot of intellectual capital invested in the no R. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, so I may be suffering from what Jean Tirole call, calls motivated beliefs. <laughs> but I, I think R will come down, more so than the markets think. Uh, whether we go back to the pre-COVID R minus G, probably not, for investment in particular reasons. Uh, but I I am confident, relatively confident, that R minus G will remain negative in many countries. Uh, in the case of Europe, I mean, there's a scenario which strikes me as very likely, which is that there is going to be fiscal consolidation, no matter what rules are adopted in Brussels. And fiscal consolidation, in my view, tends to lead to lower demand. And I think the ECB and maybe the BOE as well will be forced to decrease interest rates to maintain activity. So it seems to me that that's not a permanent effect, but I wouldn't be surprised if two or three years from now R is actually low and then we run again into the zero lower bound potential issue. Uh, there is a solution to this. It's called target inflation, but I'm not going to come back to that. <laughs> So what about France? <coughs> um, uh, no, I, th I think I mean there were reasons to think that uh, that uh, yeah um, our star will remain low at least in medium term, even if it's you know uh, if you look beyond the next few years. Uh, but um, also share the view of Pierre Olivier that the sort of confidence interval around around these estimates are very very wide. So. Um, not much more to add, but uh, I think, again, I mean, in terms of uh, fiscal strategy, this is not a very good compass. Antonio, just <coughs> one second, because there is another panel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.